Hey everybody, thanks for joining Kathy and I for a, a Wednesday chat. I'm in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, 15 to 20 about false prophets. And last week I said there were four passages that I wanted to cover which give explanation to a false prophet. I covered two last week. I want to do the two main passages that I want to cover uh, today. The first of which is 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with stories they have made up. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. False prophets always have an agenda that they want to push and promote, secretly introducing destructive heresies. So false doctrine, unbiblical teaching, or even overemphasizing their favorite doctrine. I remember a long time ago, Rob Bell produced uh, NUMA videos that I love to show. They were excellent, but just little by little, he blended progressive Christianity and kind of political correct jargon. Recently, Andy Stanley said we should unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. The most common teaching is that there is no hell and we must accept gay marriage. The point being to cast this authority and reliability of Scripture into doubt. Titus 1.9 says, He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. The thing about heresy is there's always a mixture of truth in there, and that's why it's so deceptive. It's easy to be fooled. If a teacher is a local person, then we have a chance to <clears throat> investigate them and interview them and find out what's going on in their lives. But you can't do that with the people on YouTube or the television or radio. So we must be able to discern truth ourselves. Orthodoxy from heresy. We have to know truth from falsehood. We have to know our Bibles. So we must study. Acts 17, 11 says, Now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Imagine that, kind of looking up after the Apostle Paul teaches something. But we're encouraged to do that in scripture. It doesn't matter who the teacher is, look it up in the word. Does it go by scripture? They deny the sovereign Lord. John gives a test in his epistle regarding that in John, 1 John 4. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. So do they deny Christ's divinity, his deity, the virgin birth, the incarnation? If they do, he's a false prophet and should be rejected. Groups like Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses deny the deity of Jesus Christ and must be rejected. In fact, all cults. What do they teach about Christ? We must discern and make rightful judgments about what's being taught. Peter says many will follow their shameful ways. So not only is their doctrine wrong, but often their lifestyle. They seduce many to go down the broad path that leads to destruction, like the false prophet Jezebel in Revelation chapter 2. The truth is brought into disrepute. And that gives Christianity a bad name. I think some of the health, wealth, name it, claim it, teaching falls into that category. Verse 3 says, in their greed, it's all about money. 
they want to get rich. David Wilkerson uh, made this observation. He said, let me describe a modern day wolf. The man I'm thinking of is one of the better known prosperity preachers in America. A few weeks ago, this was his message. You have heard about the coming of Jesus. You've heard he can return at any time. I tell you, that's impossible. He can't come until you're prospering, until you get your nice car, until you have your dream house. He simply cannot come until then. I recently watched a video sent to me of a prosperity conference. Here was the theology stated at that conference. Find the most prosperous preacher you know of and give him money. The blessings on him will flow into you. One prosperous pastor stood on the platform and described his cars, his plane, his house, his diamonds, a dog he bought for $15,000 and declared, I'm going to build a house that Solomon would be proud of. Then when the people in my city see my mansion and my Rolls Royce, they'll know there is a God in heaven. As he spoke, people walked up and stuffed money in his pockets. Others filed forward and laid money on the stage. Still others threw money toward him. Then a song started titled, Run for the Money. Some fell prostrate, while others ran about the auditorium singing, Run for the Money. Beloved, it shocks and amazes me how Bible-believing pastors and Christians can be so deceived. One more scriptural signpost pointing out false prophets is in Deuteronomy 18, 20-22. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded him to say, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods must be put to death. You may say to yourselves, how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. So, does what he say is going to happen in the future actually happen? So many over the years has predicted the Lord's return. Protestant predictors and Jehovah Witnesses stopped predicting the future because they were wrong so much. It's just better to leave eschatology and dates to the Lord and not be uh, predicting them. In preparing for this, I thought about myself. What an awesome responsibility it is to teach the Word of God and have that authority. I mean, eternity is on the line. James 3, 1 says, Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We really do. We must teach truth and we must live it. So hold me, Pastor Charles, and your teacher that you're listening to accountable Ask them, how are you doing spiritually? And pray for us. We definitely need it. Let me close this with John 7, 18. This is Jesus speaking. He who speaks on his own does so to gain honor for himself. But he who works for the honor of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. You definitely want nothing false with your whole heart. Have we ever thought of what it looks like for the capacity of our whole heart to be going a direction? Psalms 119.10, with my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in this, my heart, this whole heart, that I might not sin against you. Whole heart means entire devotion of thought and will often in psalms 119 then you got deuteronomy 429 but if from there you seek the lord your god you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul and then the one we're more familiar with where it couples the whole soul the organ of feeling and emotion that jesus quotes in mark 12:30. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And preceding that, both in Deuteronomy and Mark, 
You have here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So both are emphatic about the unity of God. We see the Lord himself is a person and becomes the object of the whole heart. He is one God. The Lord is one. Ephesians 4.4 4. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. God is one. And so this first and greatest commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord your God. Quote, and I'm just going to say, we sometimes watch spoken gospel, and the two that put that on said they have surrounded themselves with some great teachers, and so I have some great quotes interwoven in here of other people. It is necessary that men should be deeply impressed with deserved direction of the object of their worship, particularly that he is the only true God, the maker of all things and the possessor of all perfection, to whom there is not any being equal or like or second, in order that they may apply themselves with the utmost diligence to obey his precepts, the first and chief of which is that they give him their hearts. God is so transcendently amiable, which means lovable, likable, cordial, friendly, agreeable in himself and by the benefits he has given us, he has that title and claim to our utmost affection, that there is no obligation, that there is any proportion to that of loving him. The honor assigned to this command proves that allegiance, devotion, fidelity, loyalty is the noblest act of the human mind and that the chief ingredient is love, founded on a clear, extensive view of the divine perfections, a permanent sense of his benefits, and a deep conviction of his being the sovereign good, our portion, our happiness. But it is essential to love that there is a delight in contemplating the beauty of the object beloved that we frequently and with pleasure reflect on the benefits upon us which the object of our affection has bestowed, that we have a strong desire of pleasing him, great fear of doing anything to offend him, and a sensible joy in the thought of being beloved in return. So the duties of devotion, prayer, and praise are the most natural and genuine exercises of the love of God. Moreover, this virtue is not so much any single affection as the continual bent, and please notice the word bent, of all the affections and powers of the soul in which light to love God is as much as possible to direct the whole soul toward God and to exercise all its faculties on him as its chief object. Did we ever stop to think, let's see, I'm going to stop. If we look on God as only a stern lawgiver who can and will punish our rebellion, it may indeed force an awe and dread of him that, that, dread of him as, and as much obedience to his laws as we think will satisfy him but can never produce that constancy in our duty, that delight in it, and that earnestness to do it in its utmost extent, which are produced and maintained in the mind of the sacred fire of divine love, or by the bent, again, of the whole soul, turned toward God, a frame the most excellent that can be conceived and the most to be desired, because it constitutes the highest perfection and happiness of the creature. You know, the soul bent has become a fitting title, preg title pregnant with much meaning because many of my waking moments are thought of, of my father-in-law who continues and has left before me this indelible, enduring image upon those who love him by his posture being bent but I am seeing him as bent 
as bent to this one he loves. Did we ever stop to think that this first commandment that we've heard many times is actually the most foreign to us? Gill says that we were once enmity. There is no natural principle of love to God in us. On the contrary, men are enemies to God in their minds, which appears by their wicked deeds. Yet this commandment is still in force and the obligation to it is the same. The fall of man, the corruption of nature, the impotency, and even aversion in men to observe this command does not make it null and void. So this has to point to some monumental transforming that happens at regeneration. God puts his laws into the heart, writes them in the mind, Love is produced in such persons to God the Father who has begotten them again according to his abundant mercy and to Christ who has saved them from their sins and to the blessed spirit who has quickened, quickened and comforted them. It's really good to know that the Holy Spirit isn't one we just walk after. He produces a width of fullness, the very spirit of him who would walk in us. Romans 8, 3, what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk after the flesh but after the spirit. What does this have to do with this? I believe there's fullness to help us obey this commandment in walking after the spirit. He isn't just linear. There's a fullness in the spirit. And the love is also to the Trinity, even though we understand him as one God, Father, Son, and Spirit. For all the three divine persons are to be equally loved, being possessed of the same perfections and excellencies, and having done the same works, and having bestowed the benefits and favors upon people. So this initial command, thou shalt love the Lord thy God. The summary of loyalty, allegiance, fidelity in you and me contained in these words is introduced by the beauty and excellence that the state of mind would have for the worship and obedience flowing from such an encompassing again universal bent of the soul toward god is as much superior to the worship and obedience arising from a partial consideration as a analogy how does the light of the sun compare to a drawing of the sun we do on paper and then it's about love what then are we bound to do the one word is made to express it, and what a word. Had the essence of the divine law consisted in deeds, it could not possibly have been expressed in a single word. For one, no one deed is comprehensive to all others embraced in the law. But as it consists in the affection of the soul, one word does express it. But only one, fear though due to God and directed and demanded by him, is limited in its sphere and distinct, distant in character. Trust and hope and the like, though essential features of the right state of heart towards God, are called into action only by personal need. And so are, in a good sense, it is true, but are still properly selfish affections. That is to say, they have respect to our own well-being. But love is all-inclusive affection, embracing not only every other affection proper to its object, but all that is proper to be done to its object. For as love spontaneously seeks to please its object, so in the case of men to God, it is the native wellspring of a voluntary obedience it is besides the most personal of all affections. One may fear an event. One may hope for an event. One may rejoice in an event. But one can only love a person. It is the tenderest, the most unselfish, the most divine 
of all affections. For you and me, let's come to this privilege. It was made to encompass each so much that we would have a soul bent, that our soul bent is our recognizable posture and it guides our fullness for everything. Okay, let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, would you guide us and lead us into all truth and righteousness to follow good teachers and leaders who speak the truth of your word. May we have a desire toward you and that we would discern quickly and not follow someone of a wrong spirit who would lead us away from you. Watch over and protect your people in Jesus' name. Amen.